Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Liz. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm really good and I'm delighted to be here on your podcast today. Oh, fantastic. I'm delighted you're here too. And thanks for finding me and uh, asking to be on the podcast. I'm really interested to hear your story and learn about your business. I think it's a fantastic, catchy title that you have. And I'd like to know how that all came about. But that's later on. That's later on. Um, So the first question I ask all my guests is uh, tell us a little bit about you. So where were you born? Have you moved around? What about your education, your school? Um, you know, had your first job, uh, kind of career. And then, of course, I'd love to know how you got into what you're doing today. So over to you, Liz. Hi, thank you, Michael. And it's a bit weird being on the other side because normally I'm the one interviewing someone. So it's so nice not to have to yes. ask about the question. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, you're so welcome. I- I um, started off, oh, I was born in the year 1972, I'll let that one out. Um, so this year we're celebrating a big birthday, which I can't quite believe. Um, so I was born down in Gillingham, down in Kent. And for my first 25 years, I was very much based around um, Gillingham area, Dartford area, Welling area for all of those near. So Dartford Bridge, if I say the Dartford Bridge, everyone yes. knows what that is. So that's where yeah. I was uh, born and raised. Um, I had uh, it, my upbringing was a very Catholic upbringing. So I was very lucky in terms of schooling. And because mm. of that, I went to a Catholic primary school, um, which then got me into Catholic secondary school. So at the time, there was something called the 11 plus, which I think is the equivalent of SATs now. I'm not that sure. Um, and so we were lucky. We didn't have to do any of that. We just got guaranteed places into our school. So yeah. I had a very, uh, very typical up, up, upbringing and I got to my six form. So I did my GCSEs. We were the first year to do the GCSEs that came out. Um, yeah. I hated them. I had to say, I do, don't like doing exams. I found them a really nerve wracking experience. Yeah. And yeah. then what happened was I went into sixth, or, sixth form, uh, which was part of my school. And I thought, Oh, do you know what I'm not enjoying this anymore I knew I didn't want to go to university at this point but it's it's interesting because even now when I talk to people how very much the education system is about going to university uh, yeah. and, and, and you don't really get the options of going out to a job so at my age I wasn't jobs wasn't really talked about it was obviously always talked about as a careers and what you wanted to do And I realised when I'd gone back into sixth form, I really wasn't enjoying it. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to um, go and start applying for jobs. And I did so. And my very first job was for HMRC in the VAT department. So I started in London. So I worked right in the city in London. And I I really didn't enjoy it. I I was something called a missing trader clerk. And all it was, that sounds, it, it, might, it might sound a bit more romantic than it was. All it was was sending out forms to banks and post office to see if we could get redirection addresses for people that we'd had letters back to say gone away. <laughs> so that was right. it. So that's all it was. So I was just processing paper all the time. So I lasted there about eight and nine months. And then I um, left and went into banking. So uh, back in that day, it was the Midland Bank for anyone who used to remember that. Um, And there I did the traditional branch banking in Piccadilly. So we were right opposite the Ritz. And I did that for a number of years. And then I moved around within the bank, ending up in the corporate department in the city of London. So I've worked in London about 10, 15 years. Uh, And then um, towards the end of my banking career was when uh, Midland Bank was bought out by HSBC. And uh, what happened was we, a lot of us were being made redundant and I was one of them. So uh, we were literally just walking to our desk and there was our brown envelope saying, that's it, goodbye. (laughs) So, um, but by then I had had enough of of working in the city. Um, I uh, left there, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So um, went to a lot of temping jobs and things like that. And then 
an opportunity came. Uh, my family were moving up to Northamptonshire and I thought I don't really want to stay down here uh, on my own. Uh, so I came, I moved up, uh, we moved up in, me and my husband moved up here in 2000 and we've never looked back because I do think Northamptonshire is a hidden gem. Uh, I ended up uh, working in the charity sector when we moved up here for 15 years and that gave me the grounding and the experience and then after 15 years I thought that's enough what am I going to do now and I thought I'm going to start my own business and the rest is history. Whoa 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 okay that's an incredible story what tell me about the charity sector what did you do in the charity sector? So I was a community fundraising manager. Uh, probably yeah. the most famous one that everyone will know is Marie Curie. Uh, I started yeah. off there. So what I did is I helped uh, people who were fundraising in their community, uh, help them raise funds for the charity. So if someone wanted to do a tin collection at a supermarket or they wanted to run a coffee morning or yeah. they yeah. wanted to run the London Marathon, anything like that, I would help them do that. And then during my career, I went, <laughs> actually my charities went smaller and smaller. And I ended up at a charity, an amazing charity called Spinal Injuries Association in Milton Keynes, where I was there for 10 years. And uh, that's where I finished my career. And, and we help, I helped do all the events and all that that they were putting on. So if we had a London Marathon team, for example, I'd be down there cheering them on um, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. that type of events. So, yeah, it was a very varied career. And, and obviously working in the charity sector, you can't just pay for people to come in and do things for you. You do have to learn to do it yourself. So you have to learn how to do accounts. You have to learn how to do budgets. You have to learn how to fix computers as much as you can without getting help in. So yeah, yeah. all of those skills that were learned over those 15 years gave me the grounding to know what I needed to do to set up a business. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I mean, I did some volunteering in charities, so I'm very familiar with the community fundraiser and what they have to do. I was always helping in that area of the department as well. So uh, that's brilliant. It does give you an all round kind of experience, which is incredible, incredible. Yeah. Um, but is there... In your family, do you have people that started their own businesses at all? Uh, so I have uh, an uncle on my dad's side. He, right. My uncle and my cousin went into business together and now they're running a really successful surveying firm down in London. They employ right. over 70 staff. So I've always, um, I, I, whenever we met them at functions and that it was so good to hear their story and my husband worked for them for a little while right. just doing the odd job to help them out as they started their business and I thought you know what I want to do something like that and I want to be able right. to sort of emulate them so I sort of taken down another path um and that and that's how yeah I'm, I'm really in awe of what they've been able to achieve in the 20 years they've been running their business and yeah. I thought you know this is something I could do too I've got the skill set I'll be able to do it all right. So they that's really interesting. So you got some inspiration from them yeah. in terms of you saw them <clears throat> working for themselves, not working for a boss, having a, you know, successful run with it all. And you thought, yeah, this shouldn't be so difficult. I'm going to have a go. Yeah, absolutely. But that's having that thought is one thing, but then deciding what it is you're going to do is another thing, isn't it? So how did you decide I'm going to do this thing or how did it, you know, what was the thought process behind that? Um, I've heard the term virtual assistant when I was working in the charity sector. And I would say probably five to seven years prior to me actually setting up the business, I, I'd heard the term and I, I actually had started looking into maybe doing that just maybe on a part-time basis uh, just to see if it was a viable function. I remember I'd done all my price lists up and I was researching all of that. And I remember doing yeah. that. And in the end, I just didn't have the confidence to do it at that point. I think when I uh, set it up in the 15 years, what happened was I'd been on an event. And normally going out on like fundraising events and seeing everyone taking part, seeing 
what they'd achieved. So my last event at the charity was I'd, I'd organised a Bratislava to Vienna cycle ride. So we've obviously, we, we've, um, we were a spinal cord injury charity. So the whole ethos is that we should take people with spinal cord injuries along with us. So we've done this event three or four years running and, and, and the experience of having spinal cord injured people along with able-bodied people, it was really empowering for the people taking part. And it gave me a big buzz when I'd uh, done these events. Uh, but we were driving back from Vienna and we had to get back quite quickly. And I remember my husband was driving because we had a disability vehicle with us and we were driving that back to the UK. And my husband said to me, you just don't seem very happy anymore. And I went, you know what, I'm finished. I said, uh, it's so stressful. I haven't enjoyed it. it mm. And and that was unusual for me. I'd never usually say that. And so I knew the time was right. And one of my colleagues, when I got back, one of my colleagues uh, took me out and uh, took me out to lunch and said, would you like to set, uh, set up a virtual assistant uh, business with me? And she was a catalyst in that that was started. So I started off with this person. Uh, unfortunately, quite quickly, we realised that we were at different paths. So we did split in the first six months of the business. But um, that was the catalyst in getting me started. So I'd always be thankful to that person for suggesting it. And having someone alongside me in those initial stages gave me the confidence to do what I wanted to do. Right. Oh, that's incredible. And how, I mean, did you, how did you find customers, you know, in those first six months between the two of you? Did you already have some customers that you were going to get on board or how did that come about? So we, we took a very methodical approach to setting up our business. So I think we met in, we went out for lunch, I think it was the end of May. And what we did, the first thing we did, we got together and we had a brainstorm day in the June. And that's where we got the name Admin and More for. We didn't want, because so many people in my industry might have their name and virtual assistant as their business name. We wanted something a bit different. We wanted to encompass admin and more and not be specific to one person. So we had a brainstorm day. And in that, we came out with our name. And in those next six months, I was still working. So was my colleague. Right. And in that six months, what we did, we set up, uh, things like our website we started working on our website so it was ready we started working on our marketing so while we were still employed we did all that work and we started to do yeah. putting some feelers out about work then I left work in the December and in the December and then from January January onwards I just networked morning evening <laughs> lunchtime and for that first good two to three months I just networked and that's how we got our clients and what we did we just said look just try us for one task see what you think and then we go from there and then that's how our business gradually built up oh that's beautiful I mean what's I always love it because I made this mistake when I set up my own business I kind of although I'd kind of started uh flirting with starting my own business whilst i was still working a bit like you you know doing stuff in the background but i didn't have even when i started my own business i didn't have any kind of income coming in like staying working for a little bit you know so it was really like a cutoff point it was like day one you stop and day two you start type of thing and that was really, really tough. And the way you did it sounds more elegant that it was a slow transition to begin with. And then you got going. And with the networking, how, when you said, yeah, two to three months, you just networked. Did you go to like breakfast meetings all over the place and, you know, promote your company that way? Or how did you do the networking? Yeah, we literally went to breakfast meetings. I went to lunch networking meetings, uh, evening networking meetings. That wherever there was the opportunity that we could go, uh, yeah. we would we would do it? I think also um, one of the things that I would always say to someone who's starting out, uh, 
and and this worked really well from us and a bit, bit bit like something you've just said I think the key is yeah I th- we definitely did it the right way because we had that we were working so we were getting money to help with our startup costs really in that initial because it's expensive in that first time because obviously you need to get your branding and everything sorted your website mm, yeah so yeah. we kept working but then we had a date in mind when we were going to stop because I stupidly was under the illusion thinking well when I finished in December and then I'm self-employed as is January the 1st yeah uh, that I would have loads of time like because uh, I, I thought you know oh well I could do the business then and, uh, and that oh boy that is just simply not true if you really want to make it a, a great success you've got to get out there you've got a network you'll be working I was doing like 60 90 hours a week when I first started and you'll hear that from a lot of entrepreneurs that they will do that um and you just have to to build your business you've got to get out there you've got to do things to be seen and that's the biggest thing you've got to do in business and but you the key is to have that date when you're going to stop employment otherwise you just won't be able to concentrate enough give it enough attention to make it the success that you need it to be yeah and I always say that to anyone because I'm happy to talk about how set, like uh, setting out on this path of entrepreneurship because I love it uh, uh, you know I'm so glad that I've done it um but I I do talk to people who are still working and they go oh no like I, I won't be able to give up work for several years no set a day that's your goal that is one of your goals uh, finish work and then concentrate 100 tw- percent on your business and you will make it a roaring success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's fearful, isn't it? It, it, (sighs) There is an element of fear and you've got to push through that and you've got to believe in yourself and believe that it's going to happen. But we also know that loads and loads of small businesses fail in their first, you know, couple of years. And it takes, it's not for the faint hearted, let's put it that way. No, um, I see a lot of people come in and um, and have the attitude, oh, well, all I've got to do is set up my website. I've got to just have my leaflets and then everyone will just come flocking to me. Yeah. And then I think when I think I think that's why a lot of businesses fail in that first year is because the reality of the work. And this is why I, I'm trying to be realistic. I, I don't want to put anyone off because it is an ex- it, it is a really nerve wracking time. I do remember the 1st of January waking up thinking, oh, I'm not going to get my salary check this week, this month, because I'm no. on my own. And those three, those first six months are really scary. But if you've got the mindset just to keep finding those opportunities, you will get through it. And you might yeah. have to make some hard decisions about what you're spending at that point. But if you do it right, you'll get it back. Eventually, you'll get it back. You might have to make some sacrifices at the beginning. And obviously, they always say try and put three months living costs uh, away in a savings account. So you've got that full back while you're building the business. But I think, yeah, I've seen it several ways why businesses do fail. Um, Mm. It's the reality of not being paid uh, regularly until you get those regular clients. And it is also that uh, a lot of people think you just need your website and that's it. You'll start earning money hand over fist. And it isn't like that. Doesn't work that way. No. I, I, I mean, I remember what I did. I had I had an obsession with having print at the time. Yes, was having a website, but having lots of printed literature. Right. And I spent a fortune um, and I had my garage full of boxes of printed literature. And the reason why was when you went to the printers and said, okay, I need a hundred leaflets. They said, well, if you print a thousand, it's going to be cheaper. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Then I'll have a thousand, you know, I mean, I put them in the skip in the end, you know, this is years <laughs> ago, but I printed a thousand leaflets. Then I said, Hmm, I need to get myself, known so how can i do that oh i know i mean my business is different to what i did at the time but um i need to go to uh the nec show you know and have a booth there and with lots of printed literature to hand out 
and of course have a tiny booth and it costs a fortune <laughs> to yeah. go there you know and it was like no I got no business out of it whatsoever and I spent all this money on this booth on all the literature I had boxes full of it in my garage it was heartbreaking and the thing is you make you are going to make mistakes yes. we know you know and you look back at them fondly on those mistakes and have a giggle about it. How stupid was I when I did all that? Because you're now a lot wiser than yeah. you were at the time. Yeah. And business cards, that was the other thing. You know, you go, I'll go to a graphic designer, have this beautiful business card designed, and then I'm going to go to a printer and print these business cards. And the graphic designer will recommend a you know, a printer who's really expensive. But if you print 5,000, you'll get a discount. Okay, we'll do 5,000. And you think, oh, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, there, it's an interesting time, the early days. Okay, so yeah. you got some clients on board. Brilliant. And now tell us a little bit more about what you did for them and how did your business services evolve or were you really clear on what what you were going to do from the from the get-go or did it evolve and change and and then tell us what you do today no it's definitely so I've now been in business five and a half years um as I'm speaking to you and um it, the business has definitely evolved and um, even yeah. in the last year which I'll come on to in a minute but when we first started obviously we dictated very much around um, networking and a lot of people say to uh, especially new business owners they normally say to you and especially in my industry which is virtual assistant agency that in order to attract the right customers you need to niche but yeah. I hadn't done that when I first started and in fact I'm glad that I didn't because we then actually in the early days we fell into a niche quite accidentally and I think sometimes this happens to people and mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe you've got to give yourself some options to see what you like doing. Because if you're going to niche, you need to like doing it as well. So obviously at the beginning, we were offering all the normal admin services like diary management, email management, uh, bookkeeping. So all those basic day-to-day -day admin jobs. And at that point we hadn't niche, but quite early on within that first year, I was at a networking group and I happened just to stand up and talk about Excel spreadsheets. Now, I, even in the charity sector, I had a huge bugbear that people were using Excel spreadsheets to record contact data. Yeah. First, because it goes out of date really quickly. If you're, not, if you're not updating it, it goes out of date really quickly and yeah. things can get lost. So I was always a big advocate of databases or CRMs, whichever you like to call it. Yes. But because in the charity sector, we're always told that we're behind the curve with everyone else. It wasn't a service that I thought that I could offer small businesses because I thought, oh, well, everyone must know about CRM and businesses and databases because they've been around a long time. It's a must in business. Yeah. And I happened to stand up at a networking group and did a presentation about my hatred of Excel spreadsheets. And from that, we fell into offering a service because it was quite clear that lots of people, lots of small business owners aren't using CRMs or databases, as they say, customer relationship management systems, I should say, rather than the acronym, because I always get asked what that means. Yeah. And it was quite clear quite quickly that small businesses were not using the, these type of software. So for those next few years, that's what we niched in. Uh, so we took free off the shelf databases. And this was purely because some databases in that can be really high cost. And you don't want to be starting out using a high cost thing if you're never going to use it. And you've got yeah. to be comfortable about using this software. So we took free off the shelf databases, things like HubSpot, Insightly, I think there's Capsule. And we built people, uh, small businesses, a basic database and we put all their data in up there so they could start to see the power of using a CRM in the database because yeah. it's not just putting their contact details you can start putting uh, your sales pipeline and everything in these tools so that's what we did in those first few years and we did training around it 
And that really helped us to grow our business. So at that point, obviously, by then I was one person on my own. I was just working from home. And on the training side, that was starting to expand quite quickly. And to be fair, people were asking me if they could come and do training and coming to my house. I just didn't feel it, it was a great way to do things. So I found a small little office um, in Northamptonshire and I set up a training area. So we were bringing people in. It was, <coughs> excuse me. It, I was bringing people in on my own and training them. And we were doing like little group sessions on things like MailChimp. So that really helped grow the business in the early years. We were really starting to get busy. So uh, in 2018, I looked to get an apprentice. I thought I wanted to give back a young person way of um, putting back in to the workplace. And I also, I, at that point, I probably needed an office manager. I was quite overwhelmed with the work that was coming in. So we started growing from that point. Mm -hmm. We then stabilised over those next few years. And then... Uh, our, our skill set grew because of the staff so we could do things like social media because of the, the staff I had and then obviously the pandemic hit so yeah. Yeah. um straight away we didn't see the effect straight away but by, by the end of March we knew what clients were carrying on it the business so it didn't fall away overnight in the same way others did but um it did go quiet so this gave us a time, what we did in that time is it gave us the opportunity to actually work out who we wanted to work with. Yeah. And we were lucky, we were beneficiaries of like the government uh, schemes that were available. So this gave us the chance to have our breathing space. So from that, um, we have now niched into a completely different area, still offering admin support. But right. by the end of uh, 2020, out of the blue, we got a call from a client um, they were being given um, money under, there's a scheme called Access to Work, where people with a disability can, can get grants for extra support to help them work. And this then has totally changed our business. So in the last year, we now specialising in helping those people get their access to work support. So if you're a business owner with a disability, we will help you get that access to work support. And then included in that, some business owners will get support workers to help them with their admin. So it's a great win for us because we can help the person go through the grant process because it's quite a, it is, it's not for the faint-hearted trying to put those applications in. And, and then we will do their admin support for them after. And this has helped the business grow. So we are niching into that now. And this has helped um, uh, the business grow. And in the last year, we've doubled our team. Uh, we took advantage of the government's Kickstarter scheme and through grants and that we now have six in our team and we have four people working remotely. So in those five and a half years, we have grown, but our growth has actually come in the last uh, year uh, since we've niched into this area. So the business uh, from what we niched from in the beginning has completely changed to what we're doing now. Wow. What a great story and well done to, to you. That's brilliant. And what, so so when you're doing the, the grant applications for access to work, you're doing that on behalf of people or companies, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then how, what admin do you then provide them afterwards? So we've got clients who we're working with through the scheme. We're doing their diary management. We're doing their email management. It's a lot of diary and email management. Uh, we're working primarily people who've been diagnosed with ADHD at the moment. Um, they need that extra bit of help in organisation because um, unfortunately part of their brain can't, help, can't do the organisation. And so things uh, uh, slide in their businesses and they can miss really crucial deadlines like putting your tax return in, for example. And then it becomes too much to sort of deal with. So we will take that all away from them as part of our support worker package. And we will do all that and make sure that they don't miss their deadlines. They, you know, uh, will put meetings in the diary and make sure they don't miss their meetings. They're not late for their meetings. And just do all the admin around that. So, yeah. Okay, so these are people who run, who have some either learning difficulties or disabilities that run their own businesses is that correct that's right yep yeah. yep yeah. right so they so you're like their virtual assistant yep yeah. for 
putting those grant applications in, but also helping them run their business so they can, you know, be effective and efficient on all the things that they need to achieve themselves. Yeah, and the, the people that we're helping through the Access to Work screen, scheme, sorry, the Access to Work scheme, we've seen um, massive growth in their businesses where they've got the funding and we've been able to help them organise. So, for example, we've got one client who's doubled her business because she just gets on with what she wants to do. Um, and we've just taken away all the admin burden that was bogging her down. And she's just been able to get on with uh, what she's doing in her business to make it grow. And she's seen double the amount of clients because we've taken and organised all her back office systems, making them talk to each other, and then just making everything quite simpler. Because there's lots yeah. of stuff now you can integrate between technologies yeah. um, that will help. I mean, I, there's a, I know there's loads of talk saying technology will take us over and when we won't have any jobs left. But I have the saying you always need a lot of help to get those systems set up in the beginning. So, yeah, they will yeah. help you eventually, but they do take a lot of setting up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And, okay, so ha having niched in this area, it's almost like, I mean, you're getting paid for it now, but it's almost like you're back in the charity sector to some extent um, because you're helping people that are vul more vulnerable business people that are, you know need that support um but having niched in that area is it quite a small niche or is it quite big no i mean um it's surprising how many people have been diagnosed um with any type of disability and the issue is that they just don't know the support that's out there for them and i think this is this is what's horrible about uh things in the way I don't know if you call it our lives and that but I came from and being in a charity like Spinal Injuries Association you know uh, people with a spinal cord injury sometimes got forgotten and that's just not fair but when you brought them in uh, you offered if they wanted to come in to say volunteer for you you would see their lives transform before your eyes and I'm not just saying that just for an effect because I'm on a podcast but it gave people um, a sense of purpose that they knew they were going to come into the office. They were knew that someone wanted them to come in and help them. And I think likewise, like, as you say, I'm coming back to maybe my charity roots, but this is what I'm seeing with the access to work. Um, yeah. So for example, I, uh, I've just helped someone who had a brain injury. I, I mean, it's, it wasn't so bad, but again, it was all to round to do with his organization. He might've been forgetting appointments and stuff. And he's just been awarded because it is a long process. So you're talking about three months or so before you even hear anything. And that itself can be quite frustrating. Yeah. But he's just been awarded his grant and already the difference, just knowing he's got that grant. So he knows that someone can come in and help run his business because there are times of the day when he just can't function um, because he might, you know, he, he can't have the attention span that we can keep going for eight hours a day. He can't have that. So he naturally has to come to an end like during his working day. And so that puts him behind when he's running his yeah. business. And to, he now knows he's got his support. Again, that's transformed his life. And yeah. he now will be able to take that organisation off of him and keep working when he may not be able to work for a couple of hours during the day because, you know, he's got to where he can at that, that point in the day. So it is, um, and, I, I, and that's why I like doing what, what we do, because we can truly make a difference to someone. And this is what I mean. you your i think what's important in kind of listening to you and that's why i think it's always important to hear about people's background and the journey because then what they're doing today and what they're passionate about makes so much more sense and because of your you you mentioned the you know the changes in people with the spinal injury and when they volunteered etc because that's in your mind that you've experienced that, you know what it means to people. You have that empathy. So, okay. They may end up being clients, but 
you as a, as a supplier, let's say, as a service provider, have a much better, deeper understanding of what it means to them because of your past experience. And that's what I think is so nice about what you're sharing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, honestly. And I always say uh, to anyone listening, if someone's got a disability that you come across, try and give them a chance. Because even if it's like an employee route, so say if you're in a company and you come across someone with a disability and, and you, you quite like them. And I, I, I say it like that because, but it, it, give them a chance because if you can give someone a chance, they will always make your best employees. And again, we saw that at Spinal Injuries Association. And so we're open to, uh, we try and give opportunities to people with a disability here for work experience as well. Uh, so they can come in and just, feel like a sense of belonging uh, because in my experience they will make your best employees and they will stay with you as long as you treat them right obviously they will stay with you forever yeah fantastic so that's where most of your focus is now today is it Liz absolutely yes Uh, we have got a couple of new things that are coming but related to that type of service but yeah we've realized that you know we can get a lot of work from that because I say lots of people are putting in applications uh, for access to work so we can totally niche down that that road and give us the growth that we need in our business so that's what we're focusing on definitely in the next few years. But how do you find those people how currently do you go out and locate them and say we can do this for you can you know can we help you? So we're putting feelers out to disability charities to say, look, that we can help people with your access to work applications. So we're uh, we're in the process of sending out articles and that that can be used in like local village magazines and just to say the value of what access to work can bring. Yeah, uh, we're working with specialist people. So for example, in the ADHD world, uh, I'm working with an ADHD consultant. I'm working with an ADHD coach. And through them, they're referring clients to us who need that extra help. So, so often I get comments saying, I've just given up with access to work because there's all this information they want. Um, I just don't know how to give it to them. So we have information that we can give to you to help you. Uh, the forms, we've got templates that we can give suggesting like types of tasks that you want to use. We'd actually say we'd do that after getting a few um, answers to some questions. We'll do all that initial application through. We'll support you through because there's an assessment. We'll support you through that. We'll provide all the quotes for you that you need uh, for if you want bits of equipment, because you can have bits of equipment to help you in your job as well as a support worker. We will get all those quotes for you so you don't have to worry about it. And so we don't we encourage you not to give up in the process. Yeah. So yeah, it's just about reaching out and telling everyone what we do. Brilliant. I love it. Love it. I think it's really, really amazing. Um, and it's, it is quite unique. I think it's, you know, I've certainly have not heard about this at all in terms of a service. And, um, and so I have a question for you about CRM systems. Okay. So, yeah because you're a bit of a professional in that area. If, if someone said to you, I want to buy a CRM, I want to use a CRM system. Liz, tell me, which one do I get? I would say don't, for my first tip, don't go and buy one to start with. If you've no. not yet, don't buy one. Because if you don't like it, some of them tie you into year subscriptions and you don't want to be to have something there sitting there for a year with no it not being used. My advice would be, um, and there's always new ones arriving uh, every day. So my advice would be to look, and you can just Google this, just Google uh, free CRM systems. So your big ones at the moment are Capsule, uh, Insightly has a free version, Uh, HubSpot has a free version. We're using the HubSpot free version as our contact CRM. And my advice would be just sign up to them and just start using them. See uh, if you like and just put in and adding the contacts to even just use your contact details. Just go in, start adding your contact details. And then from there, you'll see, 
oh, I quite like this system. It's really easily laid out. Oh yeah, I can, I can work that out. Because obviously everybody's brain is different. And why someone might look like capsule, I particularly don't like capsule, but lots of my clients love capsule because it's quite easy layout. For me, it doesn't give me the functionality because what I'm looking for is after I've set the contacts up, I want to put in a sales process so I can track all my sales and my leads coming through. And I find Insightly really good for that because it's got quite a good level of reporting on the free um, side. So start using a CRM. Um, the biggest thing you need to do is plan what you want to use a CRM for. So yes, I.e., yes. do you just want to use it for a contact database? That's fine. Then all of the three free ones, it would be just about the one that you like to use. If, for example, you want to start tracking your leads and because of the uh, software, you can integrate lots of other software so for example uh, and this where again this is where you might have to start paying but this is where you have to see the value is this going to cut down a load of your time if it is mm. buy it if it isn't don't so for example MailChimp if you've got your contact forms and your e-newsletters going out with MailChimp you can in integrate MailChimp in most of these uh, CRMs but unfortunately that's where you have to start paying a small monthly subscription but you can integrate and they will bring all that data in for you. So the key thing is to work out what you want your database to do. So is it just a contact database? Is it a sales system? Is it a lead system? And then go there, start using some of the free off the shelf ones and see which one you like, and then start building in that functionality around what you want. But we're always open to have a chat with anyone who's um, looking and we'll help you down that process. Brilliant. And I think that's great advice. I've seen in probably in the last three months, more and more people asking that question on LinkedIn. They, you know, they say, oh, which CRM do I use? There are so many out there. And I've been on the journey for many years uh, with many different ones. And I'm pretty sure I've used Capsule at some point as well and got rid of it in the end. And I when I first started out, I was under the apprehension that HubSpot was really, really an expensive product. And I stayed away from it for years, for years. And then I was talking to a potential client in London. He was a property broker and he was wanting to get a CRM installed. And I said, oh, you've got to do I can't remember. It was like CA was in the title. Might have been captured. You've got to do this. You know, it's only this much per month and whatever. He said, really? Oh, why? He said, um, I can get HubSpot. I can put in a million contacts for free. I said, what? No, you can't. No, it's impossible. You can't. Not on HubSpot. HubSpot's really expensive. Anyway, I went and looked it up. And I went into HubSpot and signed up. And yeah, it's true. And not only that, you can email out of there. You can do loads of things in there. And ever since then, I've been using HubSpot. Um, but, you know, I always want to know if there is a better one out there that so insightly I haven't heard of before. But I even recommended it to my drumming teacher and he's using it or I'm using it on his behalf. And um, yeah, it's it's incredible how there are free things out there obviously if you want more functionality then yeah. you'll have to pay for it but you do get a huge amount of functionality for free which is incredible and at no point have i been hassled to sign up to a paid yeah. version that's true and, and we use two i'm being greedy in here we use yeah. two. so we use insight league uh, so we use HubSpot for all our contact data. We have all our email newsletters feeding into HubSpot because I think it's a great tool and it, it, it's yeah. good. Didn't quite like the sales, the lead system. I found it a bit complicated. So yeah. for my leads, um, we have them all coming through Insightly because I love the reporting on Insightly in terms of how many leads you've converted and, and stuff like yeah. that. So we are using two, but they integrate both together. So we've got the integrations coming through something called Zapier. So everything's talking together. Um, yeah. um, but as I say, yeah, I love HubSpot for, as you say, you can email out of it. You can do some basic email newsletters in it, which is amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and all of that. And that functionality from our website works really well with HubSpot. Uh, not so much with Insightly, but as I say, we have our lead 
system in Insightly, but they both talk to one another. So we use yeah. two at the moment, two free off the shelf ones. I think we'll be going to a paid version quite soon because of what we're asking <laughs> our systems to do soon. Absolutely. But, yeah, just go yeah. with the free versions first. There's no need to pay while no. you're working out. And Especially, I think. Especially, yeah. I was just gonna say, I think it's the analysis. So when, so as I said before, I think when you start getting towards the free, the paid version, when you feel, oh, I need to pay, my advice would be to sit down, work out what it is you're gonna want it to do under the paid version, and then work out how many hours that's gonna save you. Because just doing that exercise, those hours they will save you turns into money that you've saved. And, and time you can be using on anything else. So for example, if you're charging 40 pounds an hour and there's a task that's gonna be kind of automate into your CRM, it's gonna save you that hour once a week. It could even just be adding contacts. You could then earn that 40 pounds somewhere else. And that's yeah. a really powerful exercise to do to make sure if the paid version is really gonna work for you. And I do that for all my automations now. I sit and work out how much time that's gonna save me that's that's amazing advice yeah that's great advice well done thank you okay liz is there anything that i should have asked you that i haven't got out of you <laughs> before i ask you where people can find you <laughs> uh, no i think i've covered i've covered my story i've told you what we do and but as i say if uh, i I'm, i can talk databases all day i i love as i say i feel data tells such a business uh, sorry tells you such a story about your business that it's a really really powerful tool and if it's the only thing you do in your business when you're starting out please just get a free off the shelf crm just to start you because that will help you grow your business no end brilliant i love it brilliant so where can people find you uh share us all the different locations and how they can learn more about you so obviously we've got our website, uh, which is www.adminandmore.co.uk. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and we are, our handle is admin and more. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. And that is Elizabeth Wright, virtual assistant. Um, and you'll find me under there. So there are our four main channels that you can find us on. Brilliant. That's really good. Thank you for all that. I'll make sure they're in the show notes. It's been really amazing to hear your story. Wishing you fantastic success with a really worthwhile cause that you're supporting as well. So thank you very much for coming and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you, Michael. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.